review is brought to you by January, solely responsible for releasing half of your worst films of the year list. January, because if it's not an Oscar contender, why the f*** are you going to a movie theater in January? Okay, that one was fine. I know, an animated film released this early in the year, I know I shouldn't be surprised, but... <sighs> but, you know what? I've calmed down, I've had time to reflect, and... <sighs> I'm sure for all the five people that actually have seen the trailer, all thought one of three things. One, this looks a lot like Epic. Two, this looks a lot like the Tinkerbell movies. Or three, this looks a lot like either of those movies mixed with Labyrinth. And indeed, I was prepared to count the clock for how long it would take for this movie to not remind me of Epic. And then the film starts with a rendition of I Can't Stop Falling In Love With You and I suddenly realized the agony I was gonna have to bear. A pop song jukebox musical? And I came to this movie to avoid watching Glee. And to be clear, the problem is not the songs themselves, no. It's that there are 13 songs in this movie. 13! The average Disney movie has six! I am not even kidding. In less than 20 minutes, there were already five songs. Opening song, five lines of dialogue song, two lines of dialogue song, five lines of dialogue song, two lines- Whose iPod is playing in the movie theater right now? Okay, so what's the story? And you know what? I am just gonna go ahead and spoil everything because there's really not much here worth saving. Well, there's that one kind of big one, but I don't really care. But I love you guys, and if you really care about spoilers that much, you can skip to this time mark. But before I start, keep this in mind. George Lucas, who was not only the executive producer, but also came up with the story, also that this is Lucasfilm distributed by Touchstone because for whatever reason, Disney didn't want its name on it, said that Star Wars was his adventure movie for boys, and as a father of three girls, he wanted to make Strange Magic to be his adventure story for girls. This is the story he came up with. Setting, Fairy Kingdom, Dark Forest. I can't help falling in love with you. Oh, I'm so happy that I'm about to get married. Hey, random skank, let's make out. Oh, no! Never fall in love again. You can tell that I've abandoned love because I'm now wearing pants, sword fighting, and overall have abandoned my traditional femininity. The those two things are related, right? Hey, sister who looks freakishly similar to my ex-fiance. Stop being so airheaded and boy crazy. Never! I shall continue to flirt excessively and lean on my good platonic guy friend who is in no way in love with me. Don't worry about a thing. Oh, I'm so lonely. Oh, daughter, why don't you get back together with that guy who cheated on you? Ah, uh, come on, baby, come back to me so I can be king. I mean, so we can be together always, baby. Come on, Marianne. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Hey, friend zone, go into the dark forest and get a love potion and force her to fall in love with you. That way, it doesn't matter if she says no. Ah, uh, love brings nothing but chaos and disorder. Because I'm evil, my middle name is Misery. Sugar Plum Fairy, make me a love potion. Get the potion back through various hijinks. Say, hey, are we gone today? I know one thing that I love you. Well, as long as I feel bad about it, I guess it's fine. Here, Don, have a love potion. Oh, no, I'm being kidnapped. Got to go save my sister. I should have had all boys. You are the worst dad ever. Why'd we kidnap her again? I don't really remember. I love you. What? Sugar pie, honey bunch. Oh, dear God, stop singing. I'm locking you in the jail. This guy is my favorite character. Release my sister! I'm, I'm coming straight it on for you. you! Hey, we've been fighting for less than a minute. Why is the camera work implying that we inexplicably have a thing for each other? I don't know. Want to sing about how much love sucks? Sure. I've been mistreated! Now want to sing about how inexplicably into each other we are? Sure. Movie title drop. drop. I was dumped in the past, so now no one else can love either! Yes, I too had an equally sane reaction to being dumped. We're so obviously mental stable people, this relationship can totally work. I have an army at your gates. Betrayal! What just happened? I'm a killer. Don't you do it. Heroic sacrifice. Cave collapsing. Oh no, the guy I knew for like 10 minutes is dead. Yep, totally dead. Totally not gonna come back in five minutes. I'm all of a sudden in love with the guy who is gonna date rape me. I mean, use a love potion on me because... 
big statement on how appearances aren't everything. Oh no, my daughter is kissing a non-Caucasian midget. Faint. Somebody bury him. I haven't quite proved how much of a douchebag I am yet, so love potion. Love potion isn't very effective, bitch. I got better. Make out, make out, make out. Tell him, tell him, tell him that you love him. Oh my god, shut up. Be cool. Wise man. Wow, thing! And behold, George Lucas's Star Wars for Girls. Truly, it has the same level of compelling world building and character depth, and certainly not made out of a bunch of cliches that I've seen a million times with nothing significantly original added. But obviously, just recapping the plot cannot truly capture the experience of watching this endurance test, so here's everything else that was wrong with it in ascending order of how much it ruined the movie for me. Number five, the animation. As perfectly functional and not terrible as it is, if it weren't for the fact that the women in this movie were fully clothed, I would have thought this was any other online fantasy RPG. And epic. As a result of the movie trying to look too realistic, the movement is a little slow. All of the non-human characters have ridiculously large realistic mouths and tiny eyes, which is unnerving. And again, we're bungee jumping in and out of that uncanny valley. And you guys probably know by now, I have a thing about over-detailing and putting too much stuff on the screen. The designs by themselves are all nice, but with everything on the screen at the same time, it's just too much, especially whenever the camera decides to start spinning around. Absolutely nothing like Epic. Number four, it's a terrible romance story. I cannot deny that I'm tired of female targeted media always being synonymous with romance, or even defying romances, which is still technically romance, especially when there's already such a dearth of girl movies. But I'm not saying romance stories are defaultly inferior to adventure stories, or even defaultly awful in kids' movies. Clearly that's not the case. This isn't a terrible movie because it has romance in in it, it's a terrible romance story. Romances only work if you feel the connection between the characters. And these romances just come out of nowhere. Literally, they just start liking characters because. And then, of course, the brilliant idea to put a consent-stealing brainwashing drug as our plot catalyst, because why the hell would someone think that was a- Oh. Of course, considering all the other parts of that story that are not here, it was to show the difference between true love and infatuation, which is exactly why true love is portrayed by spontaneously falling in love with the guy who tried to drug you, and falling for the guy you've known for 10 minutes, who, by the way, kidnapped your sister. So, never mind, totally justified. But what about love that doesn't depend on appearances? It might depend on them knowing each other for longer than five minutes, though. You do realize that liking something just because it's the opposite of what you're supposed to like doesn't make the attraction any less superficial, right? And if you truly believe that love was indeed beyond appearances, show me a Beauty and the Beast homage with the genders reversed once in a while and maybe I'll start taking that message seriously. Yeah, yeah, every love story in a movie is dumb when you pull it apart because it needs to fit an arc of emotional intimacy into 90 minutes. Even Disney movies have terrible messages about relationships and problematic gender politics. Still, some accomplish that better than others. Hang on, you mean to tell me you got engaged to someone you just met that day? Are you some sort of love expert? No, but I have friends who are. Trollfully wedded. Wait, what? You're getting married. <laughs> Number three, characters and cliches. Good lord, these characters are paper thin and boring. The textbook definition of fill in the blank template avatars doing things because plot. The douchebag attractive guy who shockingly turns out to be a douchebag. The boy crazy dits, the friend zone guy. At the very least, Marianne has an arc, but aside from being incredibly generic, do action chicks always have to be synonymous with angry chicks? and or have to constantly boast, I can take care of myself while the father goes, oh, how unorthodox, how unladylike, this is still considered deviant female behavior in 2015. Did we teleport to 1995? This was old when Avatar did it. Shut up, Cameron, I wasn't talking to you. Seriously, if I was making a list of the worst male stereotypes in kids' movies, asshole idiot father figures would definitely be at the top of that list. Pixar, please don't add to that list. Number two, obnoxious. Sure, this mostly applies to all the goblin people, the sugar blum fairy, and especially the villain's mom. Oh god, that was a special form of agony. But really, all characters are slaves to the generic animation for kids doctrine that everyone must act as spastically, moronically, stereotypically, and annoying as possible. And the dialogue follows that line with being equal parts generic and obnoxious, with no hint of awareness of how not funny they are. Again, having to bear a bunch of modern references and colloquials to this mystical, natural setting, 
Thank you, DreamWorks, for your influence there. But of course, because otherwise the pop songs would feel out of place. Which, oh yeah, did I mention that there were 13 pop songs in this movie? Because even if for some reason you did care about the plot, get ready for it to get interrupted every 30 seconds. Again, my problem is not songs in movies. Songs are actually very similar to romance subplots. If they're well executed and well utilized, they can really elevate a story and flesh out our characters. The problem is 13 and pop songs. Look at how good songs are at conveying emotion. We can just tell a story through these songs. You mean you're too lazy to write your own damn movie? Well, now I know why your characters are so thin and empty. Because why go through the work of giving your characters a personality when you can just stuff them full of Elvis and Kelly Clarkson? Once or twice a song might actually have been effective at conveying the intensity of an emotion, but most of the time it's needlessly elongating a scene that could have been solved by a 10 second conversation. Now, someone might dare to ask me, was there anything about the movie that could possibly be perceived as mildly not terrible? Well, number four, animation. See, I'm not unreasonable. I put it on both lists. I still don't love how realistic it tries to push it. However, I can't deny that there's a lot of impressive effort in here. The faces are kind of weird, but very expressive. There are some okay sword fights, and the design is atmospheric and well-detailed. And when it wants to go cartoonishly fast, it actually does that well, even resulting in some scant moments of decent comedic timing. Then the whole kaleidoscope thing happens, and okay, that was just jolting. Number three, I liked the imp. It was cute, and it didn't talk, so, you know, points there. Number two, vocal performances. The songs may be narrative waste, but at least there's some decent talent behind them, a lot of them very accomplished singers. I really like Elijah Kelly. Not in this, but his singing is fantastic. Number one, Bog. While not immune from a lot of the other movie's problems, like it's really not worth seeing the film just to see him like some villains, Bog is easily the best character. If only because he's the only one who seems like he can hold more than one thought in his head at once. He's voiced well by Alan Cumming. He's responsible for most of the humor that this movie actually has. And while the whole Belle at La Bette thing still happens out of nowhere, for a movie that introduces itself with a very traditional good versus bad backdrop, where the first scene with the villain is him reciting this very by the book anti-love evil dictator speech, just the idea that the heroine and the villain would get together, that was the only mildly intriguing thing to happen. Because at least I didn't see it coming. But you know, now that I've vented, can I necessarily say that this is worse than something like Legends of Oz? Well, no, this is at least better constructed than that. Heck, because of how weird and silly it can get, I might even be able to see some people liking this as a guilty pleasure. Especially if you do like that Brian Froud aesthetic. Heck, that alone probably makes this more memorable than epic. But like a lot of guilty pleasures, it still doesn't mean it's not awful. It just hits all of the buttons on what makes kids' animation so infamously intolerable to adults. Mostly just having to do with the creators just not giving a crap about the story. Whether because it's a kids' movie or a kids' movie for girls, who really knows? To me, it was just a thoroughly unpleasant experience, as the Sega graph dictates. And I know that George Lucas isn't solely responsible for this movie, but the idea for the story, songs, and inspiration were all him, so yeah. I don't care that George Lucas basically made this as a present for his daughters. Good for him. He can go join the terrible movies produced by rich celebrities as presents for their kids club. Which is then made all the more better when you notice that George didn't even have the conviction to advertise his girls' adventure movie as a girls' adventure movie. I mean, this is the poster they went with. And I think douchebag McBlondie and Friendzone have more time in the trailer than the girls do. Oh, the marketing has to do what it takes to make money, don't you know? Yes, because clearly movies for girls make absolutely no money! But no, keep doing your thing, I'm sure your method is way more effective. But you know what? At least while George was stinking up the theaters with this space waster that at least will be effectively drowned out by the public by Paddington and the upcoming Spongebob movie, somewhere else, Disney was producing a far superior girl-powered adventure story that wasn't nearly as cliche and trite. I'm a magical princess from another dimension. Okay, so someone made a Mary Sue for Wander Over Yonder. It's still better. And now, all I can say is, please don't suck.